Today marks 35 years since the murders of the Craddock Four. In June 1985, apartheid security forces brutally murdered anti-apartheid activists Matthew Goniwe, Fort Tralata, Sparrow Mkonto, and Skrelo Mklaoli near Port Elizabeth. The 1994 Zitzman inquest confirmed the security branch had carried out the killings. To date, no one has been prosecuted for the murders of the Credoc Four. For more on this, I'm now joined on the line by Lucanio Talata, journalist and son of one of the Credoc Four, Fort Talata. Lovely to be talking to you, uh, Lucanio, on this day. It's been a really busy, um, you know, few years and few months as well. But before we get into um, the legacy of the, the, the Credoc Four, I'd like to talk to you about your involvement in uh, the situation of the American Bar Society that had invited uh, former President F.W. de Klerk to address them and, and the role that you, among others, played in having that invitation revoked. Why was it important for you to say, no, you cannot invite a former President F.W. de Klerk to come and speak on issues of, of racism? Uh, good evening, ma'am, and uh, thank you very much for the invite. Um, well, I mean, what does the clerk know about the uh, rule of law or uh, issues pertaining to constitutionalism? Uh, the clerk was a, is a, was a former apartheid president. Uh, F.W. the clerk uh, participated in, you know, in meetings where they discussed the murders, among others, of the Credit of Four, but also uh, quite particularly of the raid on uh, North Crest, the Mbendula home in Mtata, where little boys were killed at the instruction of former President F.W. de Klerk. So it was important for me to make the American Bar Association aware that this is the kind of person that they had invited. This was a person who was a, an apartheid denialist, basically, and by denying that apartheid was a crime against our humanity, he, 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 was, he, he was in essence continuing to deny our humanity as black South Africans and denying the pain that he and his former government uh, had caused on us. So it was just for me very important to make that very clear to the bar. And then if they continued with you know, their invite, then they must do so knowing the full story about who and what F.W. de Klerk was. Subsequent uh, to that uh, particular protest, that invitation was withdrawn. Your reaction to that? Well, I was very happy, uh, you know, that the uh, American Bar Association agreed with us and they uh, canceled uh, the invite to F.W. de Klerk. He and his spokesperson, uh, the clerk and the spokesperson, uh, uh, what's his name, Dave Stewart, then issued a, a statement saying that the clerk had withdrawn. That was not true. The American Bar Association had, in essence, sent us an email to confirm that they had canceled the program where the clerk was going to speak. So for me, you know, that statement by Dave Stewart once again confirmed that the clerk his foundation and Dave Stewart had lied so many times to this country and that even on an issue where they didn't have to lie, their, their very first response was to, it was to lie to the country and say, no, that the, the, the clerk had actually withdrawn. When that was not the case, the, the event where he was going to speak was cancelled based on our request uh, to, 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 to cancel that event because the clerk was unsuited, was unfit to speak at that event. Lucanio, as you recollect, you say that you were three years and eight months old uh, when your father was buried, and that is literally the only memory that you have of him. For those who perhaps do not know, who were the Credoc for, and what is the role that they played in the liberation of our country? Ma'am, <coughs> You know, the credit of four were incredible people, firstly. Uh, Matthew Gonia, Fort Kalata, uh, or uh, Sparum Konto, and Sprelom Sauli, they, in essence, make up the credit of four. 
Salom Shaoli was a teacher who was in Otoran, uh, and he didn't. He was from Kredok, but he was living and operating in Otoran at the time. The key people were my dad, Matthew Goniwe, my daughter, Jacob, and Numbulelo. And the four of them, you know, uh, there's a very famous picture of, the, of them walking down the street. But in any way, the four of them had successfully led a revolution in Lingelise. Through Kadora, they had actually seized power from the apartheid government from January 1985 all the way to June when my dad and them were killed. The Kadora was governing Elingelisha. They were the government. They were self-determining. They had shown how to take away power from the National Party and govern themselves. And there was no way that the apartheid government was going to allow that. I mean, they often referred to Kurdok as being the epicenter of the revolution. So to send a signal to the rest of the country to say that you, if, if this is what you do as the government, this is, what, this is how we're going to kill you. Not just kill you, but also we are going to get away with your murders. And that is why my dad had to be killed in as brutal a manner as he was killed, because he had shown that the apartheid government was not as strong or as tough as they thought they were, and that the people of Lingelisa had actually seized power and were able to govern themselves. And, and on that note, Lucanio, uh, give us an idea of exactly how they were killed versus the, the, the propaganda and the stories that were told about how they were killed? Well, they were kidnapped uh, while they were driving from Port Elizabeth. Uh, we would have probably been around about this time on the 27th of June um, in 1985. And after being kidnapped, what we understand is that they were then taken back to Port Elizabeth, where they were first tortured. And then after they were tortured, they were then killed individually because uh, Salom Fauli and Isfarom Konto, their bodies were found separate. They were, they were close, and they were in close proximity, but separate from each other. For instance, Isfarom Konto was shot with a, with a very specialized firearm after he had apparently tried to fight. Uh, Salom Fauli was stabbed uh, almost 25 times just in his upper body. My father, when they found his body, they, he had been burned out. His tongue was cut out of his mouth. The, 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 the ring finger on his left hand was cut off. The ring that he was wearing was stolen. They, they were parts of his, of, of, of his flesh that looked like it had been eaten by dogs. Matthew Goniwe was also stabbed. He was also, the, all of their bodies were burned. There was this one gentleman in Kradok, his name was Ungelis Kweyia. He once described it because he went to go and look at the bodies and identify the bodies when they were found. He once described it, he said, that you could almost see the hate in the remains of my father and Matthew Goriwa. You could see the hate uh, by, of those that had actually killed them. Now, this happened in, in 1985, and, and there have been various efforts from the lawyers of the families of, of, of those involved, as well as the Foundation for Human Rights, to make sure that justice prevails how far are you in uh, getting the NPA uh, to say whether or not they're going to be prosecuting the quote-unquote known suspects? Well, now we're, at a, 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 we're in a position where, where we are actually in communication with our lawyers. are in communication almost on a, a weekly basis with the NPA. Uh, and we're obviously trying to assist them as much as we can to for them to get to a position where they can then say, yes, we now have enough and we are able to prosecute. So we, you know, had taken the, 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 the very 
hard line, basically, to say that the NPA must make a decision by the 10th of July. Otherwise, we will go to court to compel them. We are now in conversations with the NPA, uh, you know, so hopefully within the next week, we, they, they, there will be some, some forward, uh, there will be some progress in the matter. We're not sure if that, that date of the 10th of July will, will be, you know, we might have to extend it for them, uh, you know, depending on what they say. But there are some positive uh, steps that are being taken. The NPA is, is now listening, uh, you know, they, they, they are at least talking to our lawyers on a daily basis. The conversations are very good. They're yet to make the decision, but we are, we, we are very, uh, we're very encouraged uh, by the MPA's stance and their posture, and we're just hoping, obviously, that they will come back and say to us that, look, yes, we have enough. Yes, we will prosecute, because I think after 35 years, um, it's time that uh, it's it's time that we saw some justice for the lives of the credit for. And, and in that time span, uh, Lucano, the docket has at some point gone missing and had to be uh, reconstructed. Tell us about that process. And at some point, uh, there, there, there was speculation that there was a lack of political will to ensure prosecution. Well, it, it, it isn't speculation that there was um, a lack of political will. Uh, the former NDPP, Vusi Piccoli, had made uh, an affidavit which was filed in uh, the Timor matter. And in that affidavit, uh, Mr. Piccoli states implicitly that he was told by Minister Bridget Mabanza to stay away from TRC cases. Well, and he then went ahead and he prosecuted the matter of Reverend Frank Chikane and, and Adrian Flock. Uh, the president of the country at the time, president of the African National Congress at the time, Thabo Mbeki, then took the decision <coughs> excuse me, to fire Ubu Sipikoli because he had dared to uh, prosecute TRC matters. So it's, no, it's not speculation. It is, it is fact that there was political interference um, you know, with regard to the matters uh, of, of, of TRC cases. Um, I started with that. I, I, forgot, yeah, I forgot the first question that you asked. Oh, the first question, I was talking about the missing dockets and the fact that, you know, oh, those dockets yes. had to be reconstructed. Yes. The issue of the missing dockets, uh, you know, that for me is very surprising, man, because it's surprising in the, in the sense that when my father and them were killed, there was an international outcry internationally they, people were interested in what was happening to you know in this small little town of Craddock. so how can the NPA lose a docket of a matter that had international exposure how can a docket just go missing remember this is the NPA they are processes in like in, in how they work Nobody can just go in and go and take a docket without having to sign for the docket, without somebody having to physically hand it over to another person. The fact that the docket has gone missing and that the NPA hasn't investigated how the docket went missing, they have not investigated who had the docket lost, and that nobody has been held accountable for that docket going missing, tells us that there are people inside the NPA that are actively working to make sure that this matter, as well as other cases that relate to the TRC, that those matters are being, that, that they're being stifled, that there are people that are actively working to make sure that these cases aren't going forward. And it is incumbent on the leadership of the National Prosecuting Authority to make sure that, that, docket is, that how the docket uh, disappeared is investigated and that the people who, who, who that they are found, uh, the guilty per, uh, persons are found, and that those people are held accountable. If it means that they need to be fired and they need to lose their pension, then that is what must happen because we cannot have a national prosecuting authority that, uh, that you know, where, where these things are allowed to happen and nobody is held accountable. Look, Anya, as I let you go, 
the best way to honor the memory of the Credit Four? For me, the best way to honor the memory of the Credit Four is to try to be the best man that I can be as an individual, the best husband I can be, the best father I can be, uh, the best uh, journalist that I can be. And I think for all of us as South Africans, we owe, because they gave the best of themselves, each and every person that died in pursuit of our freedom gave the best of themselves for us. So we owe them the best of who we are to try and make sure that we attain the kind of society that they gave their lives for. And I think anybody that wants to honor my father does so by being the best person that they can be, not only for themselves, but also for their families and, 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 and for their communities.